Hello, and welcome to this edition of the CSIAC podcast series. This is a multi-part series on the new Rust programming language, which was developed with the goal of being a safe systems programming language. In this series, entitled Rust Models, CSIAC subject matter expert Dr. James Fawcett will examine, explore, and describe different conceptual models that underlie the Rust programming language. In the third episode of this series, Dr. Fawcett will discuss the Rust object model and language facilities for representing user-defined types. Rust does not have support for classes, but does provide structs, which are similar to classes used in other object-oriented languages like C++. Traits are similar to interfaces or abstract classes and support polymorphic operations. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Fawcett, uh, and this is the third in a short sequence of videos about uh, Rust programming models. Uh, in this video, we're going to focus on uh, the object model. The uh, first video was concerned mostly with getting started, starting up, setting up the environment, and so on. Quick look at uh, Rust code. Uh, the second model uh, focused on ownership, which is a hallmark of you know what makes Rust Rust. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about models, and lots of you know lots of languages um, have object models. Most do. Um, if you're familiar with C++, uh, you're you know, or Java or C Sharp, you're uh, used to using classes and using classes to build uh, objects. In Rust, uh, the model is a little different, uh, but not that different. Um, Rust doesn't have classes but uh, it uses structs in very much the same way that uh, classes are used in C++. Structs can have uh, composed members. <coughs> These might be instances of language types, but they can also be instances of uh, user-defined types. Uh, it can have aggregated members, um, and we get that by using the box uh, construct. Box is a wrapper that manages data on the heap. And so, uh, you know, if we have a reference to something on the heap, uh, that's an aggregation. And um, rough structs have methods, just like C++ classes. We can give the methods. Uh, and um, methods are characterized by um, the first argument in the method is uh, a reference to self. And a self is a keyword in Rust. Um, um, it's very similar to the C++ um, this construct. Uh, it refers to, it's a reference to whatever um, instance of a type invoked the method that's being called. Uh, so uh, now when you call it, you don't uh, pass that address, but in the Unlike C++ in the declaration, we list uh, the this pointer. With C++, that's all implicit. Rust has chosen to make it a little more explicit uh, as far as the declaration goes, and that's probably a good thing. So uh, Rust structs have methods, and they also have something called traits. Uh, Rust doesn't support inheritance in the sense uh, that C++ does um, um, doesn't allow you to construct uh, many layers of um, inheritance with um, uh, you know inheritance of implementation, uh, but uh, it has something called traits, which are uh, very similar to interfaces. Um, very similar to Java and C-sharp interfaces. Uh, normally, traits uh, will declare a one or more method signatures, and so any class that has that trait guarantees that it uh, implements, and the compiler forces us to, implements those methods. 
So it's kind of a categorization of types into groups, groups that are clonable, groups that are copyable, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> And um, traits can have implementations, just like abstract classes and, you know, can have implementations in C++. And we'll see a couple of examples of that uh, as we go. And it has access control using the pub keyword for public. So anything that isn't uh, decorated with the pub keyword is uh, private for all external uses but uh, any code in the local crate has access, uh, you know, in the local package has access to uh, data, whether it's decorated with pub or not. It's uh, kind of like the uh, C sharp uh, extern, I'm sorry, the C sharp, uh, C -sharp internal uh, keyword from that point of view. But anyway, so access control, uh, if a method is public, it's available externally. Um, you know, to anything that imports um, uh, that code uh, and um, within the uh, package itself, uh, everything is accessible. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, traits are like a contract. Uh, they provide a uh, specification guaranteed uh, behavior in the sense that there's, these are methods you can call. It doesn't guarantee what happens when you call the methods, but it guarantees that you're able to call those methods. So for example, uh, and we'll show you that you can, you can declare a function that accepts not a type, but a trait. And that means that any type that implements that trait can be passed to the function and uh, the function um, uh, will make use of that by calling the methods um, advertised by the trait. Um, you know, for example, any type that implements a clone trait can be cloned by calling clone, clone function. Uh, functions can accept arguments specified with either types of traits, and we're, we're going to see uh, an example of that. Uh, and this you know, accepting arguments by trait is a, a, a powerful uh, mechanism. It's really dynamic binding, just like we do dynamic binding with virtual function pointer tables in C++. Same thing in, uh, uh, in Rust. Rust traits, um, uh, you know, have an associated virtual function pointer table, and so we can do dynamic dispatch uh, if we choose to. Uh, okay, so if a type implements a trait, the trait methods become part of the public interface for that type, you know, methods can be called. And surprisingly, you can even uh, implement traits on existing types, much the way that C sharp extension methods work. So um, if you look through the a little sample code in the <clears throat> Rust basic demos, you'll find a, uh, an example of me using uh, decorating an integer with a size method, um, you know, because I'm uh, having that integer implement uh, the size method. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more when we get to it. Okay, so here's um, a sample of <clears throat> implementing them. So I have a, here's a a struct, public struct. So it's a public, uh, you know, public it will uh, create publicly accessible instances, but its data is private. They're not declared as public. And uh, I'll come back to this um, attribute in a minute. Uh, here's a trait size, and so I'm declaring a function size. So this is a method because it takes the ampersand self. So when you call it, you'll invoke it with no arguments, and it's going to return a u size, you know, a, a measure of the size and bytes of that object. And there's a function, uh, a trait called show that um, I am implementing here, and this has a super trait debug. Now, you've seen me use it in the earlier uh, uh, videos, 
Um, the debug trait allows me to uh, print, uh, display things with this placeholder that contains a colon question mark. This is a, a debugging format. And the model is that um, Rust knows how to format um, most of the things in its arsenal, you know, tuples and, and arrays and, and vectors and maps and all that sort of stuff. It, it knows how to format them in a very straightforward way, you know, intended to be used for debugging. Um, and so my show method is going to use a print uh, with this uh, formatting uh, specifier. And, um, you know, so I pass uh, address of self, print. And so I'm, uh, now I'm printing myself, you know, using the debug. So I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, struct. And so it's going to, you know, just print out a very uh, uh, simple uh, description of the struct. And uh, I have now here, I have one, two, three traits that I'm defining here. I'm not implementing them. I'm telling the, asking the compiler to implement them, and it knows how to do that. Um, it doesn't know how to implement all kinds of traits, especially my own custom traits, but there are a lot of traits it can implement. Uh, this particular uh, struct is blittable. Um, uh, uh, you know, it occupies a hunk of contiguous memory, might be padded a little bit, but basically all the parts are there in one, one piece of contiguous memory. Uh, and I can do a mem copy and get a valid instance of that struct in some other location. So because it's blittable, uh, I can implement a copy uh, trait. Now, there are a few traits uh, called marker traits that don't have any methods. They're there to, to expedite, uh, you know, to direct uh, the compiler to generate code in a certain way. So, for example, if I implement the copy trait, when I bind to a, um, an instance of something else, I say let x equals y, uh, it'll just silently make a copy. It'll blit um, uh, Y's contents into this new location I've identified as X. You know, it has to be type compatible, but, but um, so uh, these are traits. And uh, anytime I implement trait, the compiler wants me to also implement clone, and the compiler knows how to implement that for you. You might want to have your own special, you know, clone uh, uh, computation, and if so, you can you know you can implement it yourself in this in the same way that you see me implementing this show function. Here's the implementation. So now I have this trait size without an implementation. So if I'm going to use that for test, I have to implement it for test. And here's the way you do it: impl size the trait for test for this type test. And you know function size, use size. Standard mem size of, of test. This is a this is a standard library uh, facility uh, that um, essentially returns the byte count in uh, the structure uh, in this in this type. And uh, so I've implemented that uh, size test, and a lot of a lot of traits, you know, just a line or two of code to implement them. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, now here's impl show for test. I have to implement it if I'm going to use it, but it already has an implementation. So I just say impl um, uh, impl show for test empty parens. This says just use the default. I'm happy with the default. I don't want to define a new function. So I could have defined a new function, but it's like accepting a virtual function, not overriding a virtual function. The same idea, you know, in C++. We can do this by not overriding a virtual function. Same idea here. It's Rust's way of doing that. Uh, and now I can implement test. So I implemented traits for test. Now I can go along and implement ordinary methods for test. And so 
I want a um, construction process for tests, so I'll impl implement uh, test. All the methods that I want to implement for tests can go in this block. They don't have to. I can have multiple implementation blocks, but normally we probably implement them all in one block. And so here's a public FN new self, and I just pick some silly uh, values, you know, X is 42, uh, Y equals 1.5. And so anytime I call new, it's going to have these values. It might might have been more sensible to give this zero and 0, 0.0, maybe, you know, you could argue, but you know, this is just a demo. So I have the, uh, I'm allowed to do silly things in a demo. All right. So if you don't know why I use this 42, uh, sometime you want to go off and read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. All right. So that's implementing traits and methods. So uh, so the structure for all of this uh, looks like this. You know, here I am statically binding uh, uh, the structure test to its methods. So I have trait show, trait size, here's the struct, impl, you know, all these are just statically bound. That means that at compile time, uh, uh, the address of these functions off in static memory is just bound into any calls that I make uh, uh, using this object. And uh, I use some pointers. Uh, actually, you can use uh, pointers without getting into unsafe code. Uh, 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 Rust has an unsafe construct to allow you to, an escape hatch uh, uh, from its typing system uh, in those very, very, very few places where you need it. And uh, for most people like me, you don't need it. You know, the library writers, when, you know, when you're writing a uh, concurrency li library or something like that, you need it. But, uh, but anyway, without using any unsafe, you can use pointers. You can't dereference a pointer but I can use it to capture an address. And so I just, you know, I made references to these various parts of the struct and then I printed them out. I just displayed them. So uh, I have a pointer to the struct and here's its address. I have a pointer to the floating point. Here's its address for the integer is its address. And the whole size of the struct is 16. These parts add up to 12 and the difference is padding, you know, um, for, uh, performance and uh, ease of code generation, um, the compiler is allowed to pad, uh, you know, provide some extra unused space. In, it's, in, it's in this contiguous block, but you know, it's all in this block. But anyway, that's static binding. Now things get interesting when we start thinking about dynamic binding. So uh, let's for a moment, let's forget the diagram for a minute. Let's look at this function. Uh, function size is some object of dyne size is going to return a size. Okay. And uh, I am just using that O dot size function. So this says, uh, o satisfies the size trait, so I can use it. Now, you know, I'm almost certainly doing some other stuff in this function. I'm just illustrating that I can use this function. And, um, you know, if I just wanted to return the size in bytes, this, that's, this does just fine. But the interesting thing is that I can pass in any type that satisfies that, that implements that size uh, trait. So now I have what amounts to um, dynamic dispatching because here I have, for example, in this block, uh, let mute t test. So I'm creating an instance of test. I could have said use new. I just created it um, this way, which is okay. And now I say print size of t equals, you know, here's where I'm using the debug format. Size is, I'm using that um, uh, size is um, uh, uh, trait, I'm sorry, that sizes function that accepts any type that implements that trait. So uh, I could have a whole series of related types that I, and I, you know, I want to use, I want to uh, quickly generate their size. Um, size is a nice little 
facility. So that's dynamic binding. It's really polymorphism in action. Even though we don't have a fully formed inheritance hierarchy system like C++, it comes real close. And uh, so anyway, so how does that work? Well, now um, this dying really is a little data structure that has a pointer to a virtual method table. Okay just like C++'s virtual function pointer tables, has a pointer to this, but now it's the trait, instead of having every type, every instance of the type have a pointer to the virtual function pointer table, now only this dying object, when I wanna use it, I pay for the price of that pointer. So now that pointer points to the table, and the table you know, goes to show, and goes to size, and goes to anything else that I might you know, have implemented for this particular type. Uh, I implemented new, for example. But uh, the only thing I'm dispatching on uh, are the traits. And so, uh, you know, the show trait and the size trait are the ones I implemented. So here's the real object, and Dyne points down to that real object and points to the virtual function pointer table. So when I pass this in, okay, uh, the compiler knows it's got a dyne object. It says, okay, uh, the method, it uses this, the method is size, and the data that I'm operating on, it uses its data pointer and goes and grabs the data that I'm operating on to uh, do what it needs to do. So, uh, really nice, nice structure. Okay. Um, so harking back to the, um, uh, back to the, uh, previous video, we talked about, um, the, uh, ownership model. And part of that was copy and move types. So copies are types, um, um, types that, uh, satisfy the copy trait are uh, implicitly copied by compiler code. You know, when I say uh, let te uh, t equal test colon new, new is copyable only because it's blittable. Remember that, you know, it's blittable. If I, had ha if I held a string, I couldn't do this because the string isn't blittable. But I've got all blittable elements here, all things that, you know, it's just in one contiguous block of memory. So now, I say let t equal test new, let u equal t, I'm making a copy. And if I turned around and said t equals u, I'm assigning, I might have changed u, for example, after I made the copy, I can assign it back to t, this is now an assignment. This is a copy construction, okay, because I, I'm binding a new variable to this type t, and here I am assigning because I am uh, you know, assigning to this existing T. So value types implement copy and clone uh, traits. Move types uh, have instances that are moved instead of copied. Um, you know, any type that doesn't implement copy is a move type. And uh, the compiler won't let me implement copy for uh, types that are non blittable Okay. So Movable types can implement the clone if I want to. So, um, so here, this happens to be a, a, a move type, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this happens to be a copy type. You know, here's the, it's allowing me to, to implement, um, uh, allowing me to instruct it to implement the copy type. And remember, this is just a marker. It has no methods, okay. Uh, it's always called implicitly by the, uh, by the compiler code, uh, you know, user isn't going to call copy on this. Um, but clone is not a marker type. It has a clone method. And if I want to use it, I call it explicitly. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, Rust is uh, making sure that I understand when I do something expensive, like I'm making a copy of a long string, for example, um, the only way I can do it is with clone, and so I, you know, I'm explicitly aware that that's happening. I'm not silently making a copy under the covers. Okay, so.
And here, you know, uh, just like uh, other languages, I have the layout. Uh, here's my code for this test. You know, here's static memory. Here's a code for test. And when I implement these various objects, test one, test two, test three, I have a self pointer. You know, so and uh, and there's a slot here in this test code for the self pointer, and only one. And when I'm uh, uh, when I have called the method on T1, it sends its address, its self reference uh, to the code. And then when the code needs to uh, mutate it, if it's going to, then it uses that self pointer to mutate it. And you know, it's the same for other objects, but only one of them is active at a time. Okay, so um, comparing uh, Rust to C++, C++ object model provides for composition, a very strong ownership relationship. Uh, uh, composed items lie within the footprint of uh, the object. Uh, aggregation is a weaker ownership. The object doesn't lie inside the footprint. The, uh, the aggregated instance is not automatically constructed. It's only done when code in the, uh, compose, in the aggregating object uh, ESCA2, uh, and it implements inheritance. Rust has composition. And remember, let's go back and look at this table. Uh, sure enough, Y and X lie inside of this struct. You know, in the memory footprint of this struct, these guys reside there. They are um, uh, compositions. Uh, An aggregation I can do using the box construct. I, I don't have an example in this uh, uh, for this video, but um, you know it's quite straightforward. A box works very like a standard unique pointer in C++. And traits provide uh, 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 functions. They declare functions. They may implement them, but they don't contain any data. Some structs are copy, but many must be moved. You know, if I hold anything that isn't copy, any data member that isn't copy, doesn't satisfy the copy trait, then uh, my struct will be a move, move type. Okay, one last comment. You know, we use these relationships, composition, aggregation, and inheritance to build interesting models. It turns out those four relationships uh, are enough to model just about everything that we need to do in software. So uh, this is a little example of a tool that might be tracking stuff going on in the software development organization. So, you know, we have people, uh, properties of uh, a person. We have uh, an interface for what, you know, things that software engineers do. And this uh, in, was C++ was a, uh, was a um, abstract class. Uh, and here I have uh, concrete types, developer, uh, project manager, a team lead, and so on. And uh, we can do the, exactly the same kind of thing in, in Rust, okay? I can have a, uh, a person trait. I can have a, a person trait that has uh, implemented some of the function. It can't contain any data, but it's implemented some of the functions. This guy could be just an interface or might have implemented, you know, some functions that might apply broadly here uh, and so on. So I can build these useful um, abstractions instead of having a whole lot of functions littering all over the place and data floating all around. I tie these together into these nice objects and have the objects that have domain specific uh, meaning. I can have these objects interact and it's a whole lot easier to manage and build code. And the message here is that I can do exactly the same thing with Rust. I don't do it in exactly the same way, but pretty close. Same sorts of mental models. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to stop for now. Um, the next of these videos will uh, be a shorter one talking about uh, generics. So uh, with that, I'm going to say uh, sayonara. On behalf of the CSIAC, 
we would like to thank you for viewing this podcast. We hope you found the content useful and informative. If you would like to provide us with feedback, please comment on this video or visit our website at www.csiac.org where you can also find additional content to review. Thank you. Did you know that CSIAC offers free monthly webinars featuring experts in the areas of cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management? Come see leading industry professionals talk about industry practices and leading research. Make sure to visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars in order to subscribe to our mailing list and see when the next webinar series is available. There you can also watch previous webinar series to catch up visit www.csiac.org forward slash webinars.